Um, this is a just another. It's a cartoon version of the thousand brains theory, it's focusing on a single column. And just to remind ourselves, the basic idea, the basic idea is you have some sensory input coming from a sensory patch, whether it's just tip of your finger or an eye or something, part of the retina. There's a movement command that's coming into the column. So a quarter, single quarter column gets some sensory input. It gets some movement input. And then in some, it is much more complex than this. And <laughs> don't, get, don't, don't, don't get upset, Marcus. It's, it's very much, but the basic idea we started with is that you have a location in a reference frame relative to the object you're sensing, in this case, the cup, you have some sense feature and you're able to pair them together uh, and integrate over time. So as you move, the location changes and you have something, you now have new things, the sensory things that you can build a model of. It's not that simple, but that's the basic idea. I'm gonna focus on a different part of it though. Um, the problem with this is, um, uh, why is it not moving here? The problem with this is, uh, what, what, oh, there we go, is that, there's an, a problem of orientation. And there's two things regarding the orientation, both on the movement vector and on the sensory feature. So here's showing a finger touching the coffee cup. And, and we have a problem because when you move the sensor, you're moving it in some particular pattern. Like uh, in this case, the two arrows represent an extension of the finger and a movement to the side of the finger. And of course, how that moves on the object you're sensing depends on the orientation of the hand and the finger to the object. So an extension of the finger on the left picture means it moves the finger goes from that location towards its upper rip, lip. And an extension on the middle one means it's going to the left and an extension in the third picture is going to some diagonal position. So um, we can't, you can't just take the movement sensor, sensor data and say, oh, where am I gonna be? How to update my things? We have a similar problem with sense features. Um, that is, and, and uh, I think uh, I think Lewis signed off, but we, we rediscovered this accidentally that <laughs> So our simulations that when you, if your finger is touching the lip of the cup, for example, you feel the lip of the cup, there's no question about it. But even as your finger changes different orientations to the lip of the cup, you're touching the same point, you get actual different sensations on the tip of the finger, but your perception is the same. You're still perceiving and feeling the same lip on the cup. So what's actually being sensed changes dramatically as the orientation of your finger changes, even though most of the time you're not aware of it unless you unless you're attend to it. Um, um, yes. And in all of these cases, of course, you can make, you can predict exactly what you're going to feel as you make these movements, regardless of the orientation. And you can yeah. predict, you know, the sensation you're going to get. Once you know you're on a cup, you can predict yeah. it pretty well. So this is a problem. This is a problem of, uh, you, you know, basically you have to take uh, movement and sensation in one reference frame, and uh, and change it via orientation to make it relative to another reference frame. That's basically what's going on here. And I'll show you a, a I thought maybe fun, uh, although personal, uh, dramatic example of this in the next slides. I hope this isn't too personal. Um, this is, I'm lying in bed in the morning. When I wake up, this is what I see. Um, and I, I was in the bed the other day and I just noticed how dramatic this was. Um, so I was lying in my bed, I'm, I'm lying down, my head is propped up on a pillow. And I look out the window and I can see some water and I usually look to see what kind of boats are out there. So. I will typically scan left to right in this image to see what I see outside the window, and that's represented by the green arrow. This is what I perceive. Now, without moving my head, I actually rotated the camera uh, to be aligned with my head, so to be aligned with my eyes. And this is what it said. So this is the actual input coming into my head, into my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's not vertical because my head's propped up slightly. Um, and I noticed that when I scan the horizon, what I'm actually doing is I'm moving my eyes mostly up and down uh, at this very steep angle. Also look at the railing outside. Um, you can see the railing has these vertical uh, posts on it. And here they're almost horizontal, right? There's, again, at a slight steep angle. And so, you, I mean, it's not like I'm not aware that I'm lying down in bed. I'm aware of it, right? I'm aware that, you know, I'm tilted for the world. But I don't perceive the image on the right. I, I, I mentally, I'm perceiving the thing on the left, and and you're not really, unless you think about it, you're not really aware that you're moving your eyes vertically now to scan the horizontal scene. And so this kind of thing is happening all the time. It's happening in, in certainly in vision. Uh, if you're reading a book and you just tilt your head to the left a little bit, you tilt your right to the right a bit, you know everything changes, and your eyes have to move diagonals to scan the text of the page. Um, if you're, you know, touching objects, you're constantly doing this, and you even do it in audition. You're, you're, you're 
your perception again is in the reference frame of the of the object you're perceiving, not um, the relative to the sensors of your ears. So this is a I, I argue a ubiquitous problem. It's, it's certainly ubiquitous at some point in the um, in the in the sensory processing. This would be a good uh, example for the Berkeley talk too. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I didn't it's know. If pretty it was too dramatic. Weird. It's yeah, pretty I, dramatic. Well, I could put this in the Berkeley talk. I, did, I I didn't know if it was like too weird. I'm talking about my bedroom. <laughs> so um, okay, but yeah, I showed there this. There are a my... lot weirder things you could talk about your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so <most> vanilla. <laughs> yeah. So it's just an amazing observation that this is going on all the time. And we're just not aware of it mostly. Um, so this has to occur someplace in the neural tissue. I have in previously, in previous research meetings, I have, um, I have gone through some ideas about how this could be occurring in the cortical column. So I said, I explore the re reference range trans, I call this the reference range translation and, and how it could occur within a cortical column. And the basic idea here is that you had to have an additional layer of cells that are representing orientation. Those would be equivalent to head direction cells, but just orientation in general. And I went through a series of mechanisms, which I'm not gonna outline here. I have the slides for them, I could show them again. But the basic idea is that you would take that information locally in the column and try to figure out how you do these translations. And I came up with several ways of thinking about this. Remember that I was thinking about slabs and intersection slabs, and none of them really very satisfactory. And I, and I never felt like I'm working well enough. So today I'm exploring a different idea. The different idea is the following, that this translation is occurring in the thalamus. And um, so we, we know that um, everywhere in the cortex, every cortical column, information that it's a feed forward information goes through the thalamus, even from other cortical areas, it goes through the thalamus. And it goes to these things called relay cells. And so here you see from my, the, the, whether I'm at the tip of my finger, um, touching the cup, I would have sense movement a sensation, what I'm feeling, and I'd have movement data, and it's going to go through the thalamus. There's a cell layer of cells in the column, which we'll call layer six, A, but it's this, there's a bunch of cells in the, in, the, in the cortical column that project back to the thalamus. It's a very well-known projection. And that the idea here is that the information comes into the thalamus at sensor relative positions, and it leaves the thalamus at object relative positions, and object relative movements, and so on. So that's the idea I'm exploring here. We're going to um, um, just, yeah. So uh, you're showing this as a primary sensory column, cortical column. Yeah. I wonder if it also makes sense to show it as a more generic cortical column with the feed forward input coming from the previous level uh, through the thalamus. Yeah. Because um, that's the more kind of generic case. Yeah, if that one's a little harder to argue, um, here it, it's absolutely certain that you have to do this for your primary sensory data, especially for vision, actually. Um, because in vision, as I'll talk in a moment, there is nothing else, right? It goes right from the retina to the thalamus, to the cortex. <laughs> touch doesn't do that. The uh, touch has a couple of intermediate stops along the way before it gets to the thalamus, and so does uh, audition. Um, uh, I could I could show that, yeah. I, or or maybe I could, and then I think I, I don't know if it's important, but uh, I was just yeah. And in, in the case of vision, uh, we the we do get I think input from the superior colliculus. That would be the movement. You do, you do, input and input. I would argue that is the efferent motor copy, but but right. the, the important point there is that um, the input does go straight from the retina to the thalamus, and then it splits on the way to the thalamus and. And it also goes to the superior colliculus. So it's like the superior colliculus is the old visual system. And, um, and then the superior colliculus does project to the thalamus as, as well. Again, I think that is the efferent motor copy where here um, the movement is actually sensory data. Uh, it's the flow patterns. I'll, I'll come mm -hmm. back to that in a second. Uh, well, I, I could show them both. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's two issues here. What do, I, what do we talk to about with Carmen on Wednesday? Well, we can just talk about this stuff. Um, but also if I, if I present this, what would I should show? Um, so I guess uh, I, I, could I can take your suggestion. I believe in what, one of my questions is, I believe this is happening in every column. I can't 
prove that. And I think maybe Marcus asked me that question once. He said, how do you know? Or maybe you asked me super tight. Someone said, someone said, are you certain it's happening in every column? I said, well, I can't be certain it's happening in every column. It seems like it would be happening in every column. I'm certain it's happening for primary sensory regions. Um, so it has to occur someplace there. Um, but I think it's happening everywhere. That would be the, 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 the most copacetic, you know, Occam's razor example. Okay, let's, can we keep going? Yeah. So this idea has a lot of appeal to me because partly because the thalamus looks like it'd be good at this and B, no one has any idea what the relay cells in the thalamus are doing. So, so those two things and, and, um, suggest like this, this is not a stupid idea. It's a reasonably good idea. Uh, it doesn't mean it's right, but it's a reasonably good idea. So here is a picture of, of, of a diagram of, of LGN, which is the primary visual nucleus of the thalamus. So it has, a, it has its own structures inside the thalamus. And just to remind people that um, there are two basic movement, uh, pat, two paces of data coming from the retina to the cortex. One is these magnocellular layer cells, we, and then there's others, these parvocellular layer cells. And I've talked extensively previously that, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident this is correct, that the magnocellular layer cells are representing movement. It's how, it's how the, the cortex, the primary way the cortex learns how the eyes are moving. Um, those cells are very fast response. They happen, they fire very quickly and they fire to change changes and they don't persist. So if there's a change, they fire. And, um, but if it stops moving, if like the, they represent the, say a dot of light moving across the visual field. Um, yeah, but if that dot stops, they f stop firing right away. So they're only they're very fast and they represent change. And where the progress other cells are the exact opposite, they're very slow to respond. So they wouldn't respond as your eyes are moving across the scene. But when your eyes stop moving, they would respond and they're persistent. So they might detect the dot of light. And as long as that dot of light is in, in the same spot, the progress other cells would, would continue to fire. So this makes sense to be like your sense feature. And as I've argued earlier, the magnocellulars are optic flow, and that is the basis of detecting movement. So I went through several um, arguments about that previously. So both these uh, sense movement, sense data and movement data are coming through the thalamus. So they both can be converted here. Here's a, a cartoon drawing of, okay, here's a, a, an axon from the retina or some information from the retina. There's a relay cell, the blue dot, and then that blue dot, that relay cell projects to the cortex. That's the basic idea. And they call these relay cells because it's almost as if a single spike comes in on this axon and a single spike comes out the other side. And they claim that there's no really no difference between them. And obviously the thalamus is doing something, but no one really knows what it is. So they call these relay cells, which on the surface seems ridiculous because why would you have all this information and in, in just relaying the data? Um, but that's what they're re referred to. Uh, relay cells, of course, are complex neurons. Uh, and um, according to the, the, the various papers, including in the, uh, in the posting you sent me this morning, super time. Um, they have uh, maybe about 6,000 synapses on them. Um, and that's represented, these are the dendritic uh, branches that are represented on the left here. Uh, the green arrows are given the output of the cell, the axon that would be going to the cortex. And um, so you have these sensory bits coming from the, the retina, I call them the sensory bits. They have in vision, they have center surround receptive fields. There's like little dots. And um, there's a convergence going on here. Um, there's about, if there's 6,000 synapses from this cell, about, about 900 of them are coming from the retina. That doesn't sound onto this one cell. That doesn't sound like a, a relay cell. <laughs> that sounds like there's converging sensory axons, which suggests that there are feature detection going on on the individual dendrites or dendrite branches. And um, these, as the green arrow suggests here, those are relatively proximal to the neuron. Um, then of course, there's this feedback coming from the cortex itself, that's this purple line. I'm arguing that's orientation. There's a lot of these, um, even more cells, uh, axons. And so that represented the, was suggested the individual axon uh, dendrites at the ends are also recognizing patterns. Um, and then the, uh, the paper and um, uh, poster that uh, Subutai is working with Carmen on is arguing that um, the, this feedback from the cortex, there's also the input from the TRN, which I didn't show here, um, enables essentially 
can turn the cell on and off under different situations. So th these relay cells have what are, what are called a burst mode and a tonic mode. And the burst mode is, is seen to be when they um, are um, most effective in their activity. And uh, so it's very unique physiology. And so the idea that this feedback proposal is this feedback could turn the cell into a burst mode, but more specifically, it could do so on a dendrite by dendrite basis. That is the essential element of the argument, I believe, in the um, the poster that you've done in the paper you're working yeah. on. Yeah. So then you could essentially say, well, this cell could respond to one pattern of sentry bits under one context, another pattern of sentry bits on another context, another pattern of sentry bits in another context. And although I haven't worked it out yet, I believe one could come up with a way that this cell could learn to represent all the orientations of a particular feature uh, and enable that orientation properly based on the, the feedback from the cortex. So it's, it's set up to do this very nicely, but something that has to be done. And, um, and that would be a very nice place to do it. Um, yeah, in, th in theory, I think what we think could be happening is it could implement almost any arbitrary transformation there. Yes. So it could learn a, a lot of different powerful stuff and it's only limited by the kind of the receptive feel like the how much convergence there is that's kind of limits how much yeah they can do so maybe it does a lot of things maybe it's just doing this one thing who knows um also to say it could do any one of these uh, mappings is true but you'd have to come up with a learning algorithm that shows how it learns yeah those things, which i haven't yeah, done here either yeah uh, that's that's the issue yeah i think you're saying it's general purpose mechanism which i agree but i have a very important purpose that needs to be done probably everywhere <laughs> and so um, maybe that's what it's doing, but we don't know. Um, there's, there's two things, a way to think about this. And this is getting one of the reasons I want to talk to Carmen. These inputs are definitely center surround. That's what everyone says, they're sort of center surround, like, you know, those, if a dot of light is it's surrounded by darkness or a dark dot, dot center of lightness, that's how these, these accents in the retina respond best. Um, and they talk about the output of these relay cells is also being centered surround, which doesn't make sense in this context. Right? That, now we're saying, no, look, look, these things are recognizing the pattern here. So the output of this cell should be a, a, a more, more sophisticated thing, like an edge or a line or a, a flow movement in a particular direction. So there's these two pops possibilities here. I asked myself, could, it, could this be just remapping, remapping center surrounds? And so like, I, I don't even know what that means. I can't figure out how to get it to work, but that's what, that's what I've heard the empirical data is, is that they say, yeah, the output of these cells is a, is a center surround RF. Um, if that's true, I'm having trouble making that work. The, the, the way it would make more sense is that the output of the cell is more of an object centric feature. And it's in the, it's already by the time the feedback from the cortex and the orientation selected one of these dendritic branches, then the output of the cell will say, yes, okay, that's that feature at this orientation on the object, or that is this movement vector at this uh, movement feature or movement vector at this orientation on the object. So B makes more sense to me, but A is what has been traditionally re re reported in the, in the literature, which I, I can't really, I have been, I've been trying to make this work. I can't figure out how to make this anything work here with all the circuitry, of like what the hell is going on here? But, but that A is there just because that's what has been reported. Um, and just to remind you, this doesn't contradict you, but it, that does change across species. What you're saying is totally true of primates, uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing where rodents, this is oriented, uh, and cats, it's not. In primates, it's interesting, it's, it's not oriented, and it even gets all the way to cortex, uh, and, and cortex layer 4C is also not oriented. Cortex actually has like an initial, an initial layer that's not even oriented. Uh, so it, it, it changes by species. I didn't know that. That's thank you for saying pointing that out, Marcus. I did not know that. Um, I, I knew about the uh, the reporting of 4C, um, but I didn't know that that was like rodents. It wasn't like that. So this is it's probably the yeah yeah probably so th the mindset there is that evolution is like hyper optimized rodents to to um, to really have yeah. pre processed stuff already kind well, of evolved. Maybe you in. mentioned that recently. I forget that does sound familiar. Um, but uh, could I, like uh, introduce another kind of twist to it. Um, there's, there's more and more evidence now that the retina itself recognizes lots of different types of features, not just on off or anything or um, simple flow. There's all these different types of features that are recognized in the 
in the retina and just and then I think I've seen a paper where that diversity is kind of preserved in the thalamus. So mm. whatever. So when you're saying flow, for example, it's that's very possible that because the retinal, uh, you know, ganglion cells that are that are detecting flow, those would be projected here, and now you'd be doing whatever the the. I don't, we don't like to call them relay cells. We call them thalamocortical cells. Yeah, <laughs> they're not probably not relay cells. But those TC cells can now do all of their stuff on flow. And in the case of rodents, I think they think the edge detection might even happen down at the retinal level. Okay. Um, and so that those those features are just passed through. And then now the LGN can do whatever it needs to do with with edges. So well, okay. So, so I'm, I'm going back to saying it's a yeah. still a it's a pretty generic circuitry that whatever. Yeah, although I have trouble trying to get it to work with any kind of center surround type of feature. It's like, okay, imagine I wanted to pass center surround features to the cortex. Um, can I remap them? What does it make sense? How do I even think about remapping them based on orientation? I have trouble doing that. I, I, maybe there's a way. I can't think of how to do that. It just, it just, you can't remap a bit. It's like, I, I can remap an orientation. I can, I can change the orientation of something. That has to be a vector. But it, I can't change the orientation of a bit. <laughs> it's like, I can remap them. I could definitely put them through a multiplexer and remap the bits. But I don't see how to do that in any kind of uh, logical, consistent way. And maybe I'm just not thinking uh, uh, clear enough or something. So I, that's why I put these two A and B things over here. I mean, the, the data suggests it just remaps, well, not center surround, but remaps whatever's coming in, right? Maybe that's what you're arguing. So whatever's coming yeah, in. Yeah, that's what I'm arguing. But, um, and flow is coming in. Flow is not just a bit. Well, no. Well, according to what, what I've read so far is that the, 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 this is very old data, of course, that the magnets of their cells really are just center surround receptor fields, but they, but, but we, the, the flow is detected in the cortex, right? So they can look at the complex cells. No, in the no, cortex. no, no. There are, there are flow cells in the retina and even, even very different types of flow cells, like looming detection, like if you're going towards something okay. or if it's left, right. So or... I think I think this is, gets to the question why I wanted to talk to Carmen because the issue here has to be what are people actually recorded from in the thalamus under what conditions? Because we may be working on data that comes from a long time ago where the animals were anesthetized and as Marcus points out, maybe the different types of things and different animals and maybe these were done in slice preparations. I have no idea, you know, maybe. Um, and so it's weird. It, no, none of this really adds up. I mean, the, the, the classic view of these is center surround, you know, or just, you know, some feature comes in, some feature comes out. Um, those features have to be vectors and they have, they should be changing under different orientations. It shouldn't be like a one-to-one. -one. So I don't know, it's just weird. So, so um, I mean, so it's, it's theoretically this sits beautifully, but it, the experimental empirical evidence is kind of wonky. Uh, it doesn't fit really. I mean, in the classic sense. I mean, otherwise, I mean, otherwise, you know, you you might say, that, okay, these these cells in the retina are responding to edges, but why aren't we seeing that in the thalamus? Is that because people are looking at uh, primates, as Marcus suggested, and other people are looking at rodents? Or uh, you know, I don't know. So this leads to basically this leads to a set of questions. And these are the questions I had. Uh, to I, I will jump in and just say like the um if it if it was bits if, if it is center surround or literally just pixels I mean you can simplify to that to make this point if it was literally just white and black pixels being represented um, you could perform a, a you could take an orientation and rotate that it's just you you have to change your mindset a little bit think of I each can't. cortical column as receiving a small input image like a small part of what's coming in. A small set of pixels. Yeah. Okay. And you can rotate that set of pixels like locally. Uh, yes, but um, oh, I think you're saying it would take a lot more. Uh, you might be thinking that you need widespread connections and like a big a big rotation, which I don't think would, would occur. No, no. Uh, what I'm trying to think here is like, um, you know, I, okay, imagine I got this set of pixels coming in, but it's, uh, any particular bit, 
um, might have to be mapped to any particular. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, is it, is it, is it too much computational to ask? I mean, you just said, oh, you can't do a too big an image, but even a small image, could, <laughs> is it too much to ask to, to do that? To, to, because, you know, any individual bit could be mapped, could potentially be mapped to any other bit. And then you end up with a very computationally difficult problem to solve, it seems. You know, yeah, measure, right. uh, you know, what if I have 16 by 16 bits, 256? Well, then, then any relay cell would have to have 256 mappings, you know what I'm saying? And, and 256. Hmm. You know, another thing is, um, it appears to me that we actually don't do this in a purely, uh, it's not a complete way, meaning we have to learn these orient these rotations and some of them we never learn. You know, I, I showed the picture of me lying in my bed. If I keep rotating my head until my head is now below the horizontal, I find it very difficult to do the task. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like looking at a picture of a person's head upside down. We just never see that and it's really difficult to, to deal with it. Um, but if I wrote, you know, so you can rotate a certain amount and no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. And after some point it starts getting harder and then all of a sudden you just can't do it anymore. Um, however, if I'm do manipulating an object like my uh, pen in my hand, I never have any problems with it in any position or any orientation. So it's, it's sort of like, yeah, with pens, I've seen them all different orientations and therefore I can, rec I can recognize it in any particular orientation. I can mail it in any particular orientation. Heads, I can't do that with. The, wind the view from my window, I can do a good, good portion of looking at the world somewhat horizontally. Um, so my, my point here is that the, I don't think we have to, we, we have to learn, I believe we have to learn these things and, uh, and that we don't have to learn every, every translation. Uh, well, at least we don't learn every translation. Um, it also reminds me of the inversion glasses that people could wear, uh, where you put on the inversion glasses, it's really, really hard to, do, to see and to move but people wear them after a few months, you get, you get okay at it. Um, so somebody's learning this translation, we were learning it. Um, and, uh, and so I think, I guess, I'm, again, I'm just gonna point out that it's not like this is this hardwired mechanism that can translate anything to anything. It's more, it's gonna be some sort of learn system where it says, okay, these are the things I typically see, I'll learn how to translate them. So I don't know, maybe you're right, Marcus, maybe you could do it on Santa Saran. Uh, I don't know. It just feels like it was hard. Maybe you, I, maybe you can help me think. I'll play around with it, but if you can think of better ways of thinking about that. Um, that would solve one of my big problems because I'm thinking like, okay, you know, why aren't we seeing these more complex features leaving the LGN, uh, leaving them, you know, the relay cells? So these are the questions I had for Carmen. Um, so in some of them we've already addressed already. I said, I read the output of the LGN cell, relay cells have center found or is this true? Is there any contrary evidence? You point out there is some. Does anyone characterize these cells in awake animals? And, you know, again, if I took a monkey and I, and its head was perfectly vertical and I was doing things, I might not see anything. But, you know, if the monkey's sitting there with his head tilted to the side and I'm, and I'm probing and he's doing visual tasks, I might see this. Um, and then the question is how many, you know, there's a lot of data about relay cells in vision, but have relay cells in other modalities be similarly characterized? What do we know about touch um, and hearing? Anything? Um, another question is, I've always been under the impression that the layer six cells that project back to the thalamus are the same cells that project the, la that project the layer four. Uh, that, I, I think so. Yeah, that requires an explanation. I don't really understand. If, if I was doing the translation in, in um, in the thalamus, and so I've now rotated the, the 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 edge of the retina or the edge on the tip of my finger, and now I'm passing that to the cortex. Um, why would I need to send the the um, the orientation signal to the layer four cells as well? That doesn't make sense. Why would I be doing it in both places? I don't I don't have an answer to that question. Just a fun little fact: uh, those cells also receive thalamic input. Those one, the, those the layer six cells. Is it them? Yeah. I thought that I thought it was um, adjacent cells. I thought it was the cells in the uh, bottom layer five, upper layer six, and not the same cells. Are you sure it's the same cells? So the the Thompson paper points out that you you get like this kind of triangular connectivity between 
thalamus, these layer six cells, and the layer four cells, where it's pretty much all reciprocal, except for there's no four down to thalamus, but everything else is reciprocal. There's no what on the thalamus? Uh, four, layer four, you know this already, oh, but layer yeah. four doesn't project to the thalamus. But otherwise, this triangle, every side is mm. like a, a undirected graph or a two, two, two yeah. arrows. So that, anyway, that doesn't make sense. So I was questioning that a little bit too. You know, it's very hard for people to know all this stuff. And so, and I found over the years that sometimes they get it wrong and then it becomes a sort of dogma. So you don't want to assume it's wrong, but on the other hand, you can't 100% assume that everything you read is right. So that's a that's complicated. So, but maybe it's more complicated than that, you know? But this, this conversion has to be happening. And so, um, you know, at one point, of course, the layer, the layer six cells, the orientation has to has to be derived from sensory data, um, and so you would somehow the, the layer six cells have to learn, you know, have to be get information that tells them what is the proper orientation now, um, and and you have to be able to update through a through the, the orientation through a path integration as well. So that makes it complicated. Here's another interesting uh, number four here. Um, so the layer motor output cells, every core of a column has motor output cells. And these are the layer five intrinsic and bursting cells. They're called layer five IV. And so these would likely represent movement relative to the object, that they would represent, um, as I proposed in previous research meetings, in a, they, in a particular mini column, that mini column would be representing movement in a particular dimension relative to the, in the object space. And the layer fives, we can explain how they've learned that and then they would be able to generate behavior so uh, so in that scenario then they represent movement in a vector in a one-dimensional vector in the object space now but that has to get converted back to sensor movement right because i you know, might saying oh move my eyes from left to right in the scene um but that means in this case i have to move my eyes up and down so I said, well, where's that going to occur? Well, maybe the layer five cells aren't in object space. Maybe it's somehow, it's already been converted back to, to center space, but I, I don't think that'd be the case. Um, so you might argue, well, it's okay that the cortex is sending object-centric vectors, movement vectors, uh, someone else will take care of it. So if, um, if layer five cells, we know that they project to the spurred colliculus, well, the spurred colliculus also has to do this reference frame translation the tricholiculus is its own little visual system. It's primitive, but it's its own visual system. So almost certainly does its own um, reference scale or reference frame translation of some sort. And so maybe the layer five cells are just projecting to the back side of that. They're projecting to the cells in the supercoliculus or already back into um, in, uh, in the center, center reference frame. That's quite possible. Um, but it's also very interesting that the layer five are intrinsically bursting cells. They have a tonic and burst mode, just like the thalamic relay cells. In fact, those are the only two cells that I know of. That we've, we've looked for it. So there's some evidence of some layer three cells have this too. So we've spent some time in the past trying to see like how many of these cells have this intrinsically bursting mode. So, but if we take it on the surface, it might be that cells that have this intrinsically bursting or this bursting mode um, uh, could all be doing conversion. They could all be doing multiplexing, that it is possible in fact, it is possible that all pyramidal cells are doing this, possibly doing this, some sort of this multiplexing. I mean, that's a, a more radical idea, but it's it's like, boy, that would be another powerful operating principle if it were true. That well, that, these... that's, uh, I mean, in some sense, that's partly what our temporal memories is doing. You know, depending on the context that's coming in and active dendrites, different cells will become active. Right? Um, yes, you're right. Uh, interesting. Yeah, duh, of course, I should have thought of that. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I don't remember, we, we did some searching a while back. We we're trying to find out do layer three cells burst? And there was some evidence that they do, and there's some evidence that, that it's not many of them do it. Um, and it was another one of these gray areas. Uh, yeah. not, that, not that you necessarily need to have the bursting, um, but I'm thinking like the, as you just said, you know, our temporal memory requires something like this. We don't think of that as a reference, we don't think of that as a reference or transform in that case, but it is a multiplexer of sorts. But it's, it, in that case, it's, well, it's interesting there 
Well, we think think about the think about the, the temporal memory cell, the pyramidal cell. It's not it, it, ideally to just be one dendritic segment that is that is active, right? Um, yeah. But but we don't enable one or disable one. We just we just we just add them all up, right? So in the temporal memory, it's like okay, any dendritic segment that generates an, an MDA spike, uh, it it there, there's no enabling or disabling them. They're just like if I recognize a pattern. Um, then the cell gets depolarized. Here, it's a little different. Here, it's like, I recognize a pattern, but I don't want to send it to the soma, or at least I don't want to, I don't want the soma to spike on this unless I have the right context. Now, we never talked about that, but there, there could be a, an additional context on the distal dendrites on, on all pyramidal cells that would work like that. So maybe in some sense, you could think of it this way. Um, Oh, this is this is really interesting. It's coming to my head. Think about our temporal memory. We have uh, with NMDA spikes to depolarize the cell, but they don't make the cell fire. That's the basic idea. In this case, with the thalamic relay cells, what we're saying is, oh yeah, a dendrite recognizes a pattern, but under the right context, which is at the very extreme ends of the dendrites, that's coming back from layer six. Uh, under the right context, we want that cell to fire. It's not like we're going to depolarize the cell. We want the cell to spike. So you've got an additional layer of computation here. You got, okay, we're recognizing patterns, depolarizing the cell, yes, but um, we only want the cell to spike if we have the context at the end there. Um, and I guess I was thinking of the thalamic relay cells, that I, and I didn't think of it as, as necessarily um, uh, having this depolarization phase or prediction stage. Anyway, uh, there's too many things going on here, but it, the idea that perhaps in general, if you think about neurons do, there might be this, okay, neurons have these, um, the, they have you know, these feed forward patterns, uh, which are, um, which, you know, are near the soma and they are recognized and they can make, um, and they can depolarize the cell. And then maybe further out on the dendrites, um, you have an additional signal, which modifies that even further. Um, and so that's like a, 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 that could be more of a general sort of principle. Interesting. I don't know. Well, anyway, going back to this problem, we need to convert the motor movement from an object-centric reference frame or internal reference frame to the column to, um, to a different orientation, depending on the sensor orientation. And those are two possibilities of how it might happen. It might occur subcortically, or it might be that the layer five cells are doing it themselves. And um, in which case, if it was the layer five intrinsic and bursting cells, then you, you would think you might, the layer five intrinsic conversing cells, we need to have maybe the orientation um, signal from layer six project to their distal dendrites. I don't know if that's known to be true or not. So then you'd say, oh, these layer six orientation cells or wherever I have orientation cells, they need to project to the thalamus, they need to project to layer five as well. Um, so I don't know if there's any evidence for that. So there's a lot of questions here. Um, a lot of, doesn't make sense, but. What I'm, what I'm excited about is it's very, very clear that this has to occur and has to occur everywhere, um, or at least often and independently, especially for touch. Well, you know, again, with touch, I have to do this independently for each part of my sensory skin because they're moving around independently. With vision, one could argue, oh, we could just do the orientation transfer once for the whole eye because they're all moving together. You know, so that's a little bit more complicated. It you know, doesn't have to be on a column by column basis. Uh, could be, it doesn't have to be. All right, those are my slides uh, for mm. Carmen and my questions for her. Have you got any suggestions beyond what you guys said already? Yeah, what, so one terminology nitpick, um, you keep saying reference frame translation, and yeah. at least for a lot of people, that's gonna conjure a, ref, a translation of a reference frame, it's, it, which is like a displacement of a reference frame, translating. Oh, oh. Uh, so yeah, you know I mean? yeah. Well, what would be a better <laughs> yeah. term? I mean, transformation is the more general word, a, re a re reference frame transformation. Uh, would that not, uh, that sounds more general, like that include both orientation and physical and, displacement. Yeah, and scaling yeah. as well, yeah. mostly. Yeah. So, so if you, I, I really well, you, can use ro you can do rotation if you want. Oh, rotation. If you want to be specific, you to, be specific to just that. I did, I was being specific to that. Um, yeah, that's fair. So reference frame rotation. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out, Marcus. I think that was confusing me too. Uh, 
translation so, is very much just physical displacement um, to me. If I said that, do I use it? Do I use? Uh, do I actually write, have that written down anywhere? Or do yeah, I, you do. Yeah, there's one. Here. Yeah. Okay. Oops. God. Come on. Um, okay, that's a good idea. Um, and another another thing you might find interesting that I can connect this to your um, your beach pictures. I can't connect it to the thalamus very well, but just an experimental result we haven't talked about in a long time involving grid cells. Yeah. Is, um, so it, one one weirdness of grid cells that we haven't talked much about is that in primates, it also seems to track your vision, like uh, where you're looking, where where in your visual field you're focusing uh, where, where you're saccading or even where you're attending. Um, Ruby, the, the, the grid cells. Yeah. Uh, it, and it was first discovered in 2012 in primates, uh, Beth Buffalo, um, recording grid cells uh, as, as, the, as the primates like look around their visual field. Uh, they find cells that fire at grid space uh, uh, hexagonally in entorhinal cortex. Um, but isn't that, what, isn't that what we would hope to find? I mean, in sense I mean, that I mean, um, we've always we've always talked about like okay, you got your eye; it's looking at something. Um, but I guess here I'm just talking about like it's it's like it's almost just eye direction is encoded by, encoded by grid cells. It's just where you're looking up, down, left, right. Uh, it's it's it doesn't seem to be in some. Well, oh, it's not. It's not. I need object. to get to a second it's, part when I, I I'm I'm building up to it toward a second part. Where okay. it does actually start to have an external reference frame, but it, it's still weird to me. I still can't fully explain it. Um, maybe let me say the second part, and then any any more discussion can can happen. Um, so first, that was discovered in primates. Then they found uh, in humans using the fMRI trick, they were able to find something similar. Um, that uh, two different labs found that, and um, so so humans saccading around. Uh, so so okay, here's the experiment. Um, you're, lo you, you're looking at something that's box shaped or rectangular shaped. You're performing some task, like maybe following a dot inside of it. There's, there are two different studies that use two different tasks. And um, so as you're looking around this box, uh, you know they can find grid cells, or rather they find the fMRI hexadirectional signal that indicates there are probably grid cells uh, as you look around. Um, now, here's the interesting part. Uh, one of these studies, I'm, I gave mad props to Josh Julian, who who um, who chose to run the second part of the experiment. They took the rectangle and rotated it like 15 degrees or something like that. Um, and so now now a person's looking at a rectangle that's been like turned to the side a little bit, um, and the hexadirectional fMRI signal rotated with it. So um, so now the so it seems that there are grid cells responding to where you're looking in this image that rotates with the image uh, doesn't that isn't that isn't that make sense i mean that's that's just being an allocentric grid cell right i mean why is that i mean it's a cool result but what is it surprising uh first of all i'm bringing it up now because it very much mimics what you're um what yes. you did with your beach yes. photos yeah yeah um, so that's why i'm bringing it up now talking through mechanisms of object recognition you Using grid cells for eye direction is weird to me. I don't have a full description why you would use grid cells for eye direction. I guess it, and maybe I'm confusing this eye direction. It's, it's not, you're saying it's not where in the box I'm looking. It's, I'm confused. How's it not represent? It's not representing where the location in the rectangle. It's representing. That's fair. Uh, that's fair. Maybe that's the, that maybe that's the way to think about it. Uh, that might be the answer. Yeah. I mean, it's what's, what's interesting is uh, well, we, we've, we've talked in the past, okay, so you got your eye and your retina and it's at some distance from something, right? And the question is what, what's being represented by the grid cells? Is it representing where, the, where the, the, the retina is relative to the box or is it representing where the thing I'm looking at, you know, like the feature I'm looking at relative to the box? Yeah. Um, that might suggest it's that, the latter. It's like, yeah, the visual cortex is like, I assume this is visual cortex you're looking at, right? Um, what, what I was talking about there? Yeah, with that, the fMRI that, signals. Um, oh, this yeah, this oh, was oh, in three, three areas. It was entorhinal, it was in um, um, prefrontal, and oh. a slight signal in parietal cortex. So parietal is kind of visual. Oh, so it's not the really visual cortex. Um, a little bit later. You know, then there was that paper, remember that the paper from the Chinese lab that I got earlier this year? 
where they were claiming they find grid cells and pl in place cells in V1 itself in S1. <laughs> and then you said that maybe some, some people were discounting that work. Um, um, I don't know. That's, I thought it's fascinating. Well, okay. Um, anyway, that, that topic was a little more out there, but at some yeah. point we're going to ponder that. <laughs> I, I, I just, just keep believing that the end is all going to be very simple and clear. <laughs> Once we get past all this, somehow it's going to be like, oh yeah, it's, it's not simple. It's not trivial. It's complicated. But once you get it, the whole thing will fall together and all, this, all these questions will be obvious. Um, we're not there yet.